I'd like to congratulate the Army. This entire conference is, as I see it, part of a resurgence in Army force development, which is the how the Army can focus its effort to take these ideas and turn them into action. I'm going to offer some remarks at the end. The rules of engagement, I list my personal interests in the biographical notes. I'm here solely in my Exeter University capacity. You've also seen our speakers' profiles and will be joined by the panelists again after Professor Cohen's remarks. I won't repeat their bio notes. Uh, a reminder, uh, our keynote speaker's address is on the record, but everything said by us and by you after Professor Cohen's talk is off the record. Why? Not just that, because that's the tradition, but because forced development is about a structured argument. So let's get the argument underway. Our speaker, many of you know Professor Elliot Cohen. I first met him in 2003, and he is a remarkable man. In the British military community, we have valued his critical but always constructive analysis. His candor is the hallmark of true friendship. For example, I well remember his observations about my army's fighting power at a particularly difficult time that gave the army board cause to think very hard. It was a number of weak signals that we needed to take note of. And that will be the theme, the weak signals and the time it takes to heed them and act on them. That's what I will close with at the end. Now that's another facet of force development. It's uncomfortable or it's not doing its job. So if anyone says anything that offends you, I'm afraid that is part of the force development game. When I was leading the team writing the UK's first stabilization doctrine back in 2008, I based the final chapter of JDP 340 on the framework that Elliot Cohen and John Gooch used in this superb book, Military Misfortunes. That framework, anticipate, learn, and adapt, is why we turn to him for this keynote. Elliot. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you for that introduction, and I want to uh, thank RUSI and uh, CGS for having me here. Uh, although you do have to admit it's a somewhat odd venue for a Jewish guy to lecture about war. Um, as I understand my task, um, I was supposed to talk about the idea of obstacles to adaptability. Um, I, I will confess I was sorely tempted just to get up here and say, Brexit, <laughs> and then just sit back and watch the fist fights uh, break out. But um, that, that would be out of keeping with the spirit of this house. So instead, I will uh, do something that's much more appropriate. I will cut to a verse from a sacred text upon which I will preach a sermon. Um, and of course, following the right reverend um, uh, Sir Hugh Strawn, the sacred text is uh, Clausewitz's On War. And the verse is as follows. The first, the supreme, the most far-reaching act of judgment that the statesman and commander have to make is to establish by that test the kind of war on which they are embarking, neither mistaking it for nor trying to turn it into something that is alien to its nature. So this is the first of all strategic questions and the most comprehensive. Now, I'm increasingly convinced that this, as much as, of course, the much better known uh, phrase, war is a continuation of politics by other means, is really central to what Clausewitz has to teach us and is of the utmost relevance to us today and to the topic of this symposium. The issue is not simply figuring out what one's political masters want, even though policy is always shifting, politicians are not always, not even perhaps often explicit, and making war serve the ends of policy is difficult in the extreme. I think we're all familiar with that central Clausewitzian proposition and the difficulty in trying to follow it. This is something rather different. What did Clausewitz mean by that phrase, alien to its nature, when speaking of war? For that matter, what does it mean to talk of the nature of a war? Why does he think that we often mistake one war for something else? What does it possibly mean to try to turn a war into something that is alien to its nature? Clausewitz is not, I believe, giving a, a version of that insipid proverb about militaries always trying to fight the last war. 
that is at best only a half truth. What I'd like to do is unpack what he had to say and then um, move on from there to talk about what I think are some of the causes of militaries misunderstanding the nature of their wars. The nature of a war, I suppose, are the structural elements that are familiar to all of us, the political purposes for which it is fought, but more deeply, the nature of the societies that wage it and the means that they use. And even if one is very familiar with those societies, understands the technologies and organizations, and above all, one's own and the enemy's political purpose, it is nonetheless common to mistake the nature of a war. Take, for example, the American Civil War. Initially, even Abraham Lincoln, as great a civilian war leader as any, uh, and his professional military advisors, many of them, if not all of them, quite competent, mistook the magnitude of the forces involved. Lincoln thought that the kind of war he was engaged in could be decided in months, and he thought that it could be decided by destroying the army of the Confederacy, which he took to be the center of gravity, as we would now call it, of the rebellion. His professional advisors, by and large, agreed with that assessment. Instead, he discovered that it would be a war that would have to go on for years, and which would have to be decided not simply by defeating an army, but by breaking the will of the people of the South to resist. More recently, I would argue, the United States initially misunderstood the nature of its war in Iraq after 2003 as a kind of concluding fight with bitter enders and former regime elements, when in fact what we were encountering was a much more complex struggle or set of struggles including deep sectarian conflict and a proxy war conducted by Iran. There are all kinds of misunderstanding of the nature of a given war, misunderstanding the very nature of the participants. Are they cohesive or fragile or divided? Its stakes, can this be settled by compromise or does it have to be fought through to the bitter end? The logic of operations by which it is fought, is this a war of decisive engagements or instead one of grinding attrition? The determinants of victory, overwhelming resources, or is this all about determination and whose determination? Is it about shattering an army or breaking the will of a few politicians or that of an entire society? Very well, what then leads us to misunderstand the nature of a war or try to turn it into something alien to its nature. In other words, what gets in the way of us adapting to the realities of the conflicts we face? Let me suggest three causes. Ghosts, deep sleep, and pixie dust. Let's begin with ghosts. Military organizations are always haunted by ghosts. Going into Vietnam, the United States military was in some ways haunted by the ghosts of both World War II and of Korea. It was shaped by a desire to live up not only to the achievements, but also to the style of the commanders of World War II, and by its desire to avoid the seeming inconclusiveness of Korea. Coming out of Vietnam, it was possessed by the desire to drive off, drive off the ghosts of that conflict. The rhetoric of the first Gulf War, we may remember, was to a remarkable degree about fighting the ghosts of Vietnam. Take an Air Force example. The initial campaign in the first Gulf War was called Instant Thunder, to distinguish it from Rolling Thunder. That was an attempt to exorcise a ghost. And in some ways, that effort to exorcise those ghosts were productive. The great reforms of discipline and training in the American military of the 1970s did pay off in 1991. But in other ways, the preoccupation with Vietnam was pernicious, particularly in the desire for clear-cut beginnings and ends that, in retrospect, set up conditions that led to a second, far costlier, and more protracted Gulf War. Those same ghosts, I would argue, prevented the United States military from adequately preparing itself for that second Gulf War, particularly for protracted military governance operations and counterinsurgency. Armies can also conjure up ghosts in the hopes of gaining from their spectral wisdom. Consider the United States Army and the Wehrmacht. From the 1970s through the early 1980s, 
The United States Army developed what I considered at the time and continued to think of as an unhealthy fascination with the Wehrmacht, all in service of the slogan, fight outnumbered and win. A very narrow kind of operational art which neglected, among other things, the fact that the Wehrmacht fought outnumbered and lost. Ghost cults can be seen as well in the slavish imitation of the, st of the style of a previous war or of other kinds of commanders, as we sometimes see, for example, the desire of some commanders in Afghanistan and Iraq to imitate an outstanding general, David Petraeus, when they weren't David Petraeus. We should ask ourselves, I think you should ask yourselves, what are the ghosts of Afghanistan and Iraq? Which ones will come and haunt us in our dreams? and we, might we do foolish things to try to ward them off? Which ones, conversely, will we attempt to invoke, rather in the way that Macbeth went back to visit the witches? And most importantly, which of these ghosts should we simply ignore or exorcise? Second obstacle to adaptation, I would argue, is reflected in another verse from the sacred text. In the absence of a true theory of war, routine methods will take over, even at the highest levels. I think that, again, is one of those gems in Clausewitz that one does not fully understand until you have contemplated the highest levels of government in action, preferably close up. The extent to which first order questions are rarely addressed, and the sometimes scary degree to which presidents or prime ministers and ministers of state, and also chiefs of defense staff and combatant commanders, will invoke cliches and proverbs rather than tackling a problem as it really is. I think what we have here is an extension of a phenomenon that John Stuart Mill captured in his ever relevant essay on liberty in the phrase, the slumber of decided opinion. So deep sleep. Routine methods, at least at the level of a strategy, are a comfort because the alternative is always to be saying, well, maybe that's no longer true. What are some of the routine methods that perhaps we should be aware of? Well, one a result of our recent conflicts is an insistence on what is often called whole of government solutions. I suspect that this has become increasingly a crutch for military commanders in my country, perhaps in yours, who want to avoid focusing on what their branch of government can actually do. It's a lot easier to blame the diplomats for example, for failing to administer a shattered Arab city. Although, if you think about it, no one after Hurricane Katrina leveled New Orleans said, for God's sake, please send us an ambassador. <laughs> I would argue, in fact, that one of the lessons of Iraq and Afghanistan is as much about the limits of whole of government operations and whole of government solutions as their importance. Or take an older example, our military's attitudes over time towards urban combat. Up until, again, sometime in the 1980s, perhaps afterwards, US Army doctrine was essentially to bypass cities on the grounds that it was too difficult and too devastating to fight in them. We discovered, as the Israelis did too, however, that urban warfare was unavoidable, and that indeed modern militaries can conduct it without, on the one hand, suffering casualties on the scale of World War II, or inflicting comparable levels of devastation to civilian populations and infrastructure. It might have been better if we had thought about that one afresh from time to time. John Stuart Mill again, talking about what he called the fatal tendency of mankind to leave off thinking about a thing when it is no longer doubtful. And he says this is the cause of half their errors. The final source of error I take to be the most dangerous of commodities strategic pixie dust. By that, I have in mind formula that are supposed to alleviate or remove difficult problems. Magical thinking, as opposed to problems of strategy, or to use John Stuart Mill's words one last time, the use of dead dogma as opposed to living truth. Take, for example, Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty. Members of NATO have been in the habit for a long time of talking about Article 5 protections, particularly for its most exposed members, those of the former Warsaw Pact. But Article 5 is a commitment to wage war, 
with all that entails. And I wonder whether it is a living truth, for example, to German politicians. I have my doubts. Some older examples of strategic pixie dust include terms like end states and exit strategies, terms which confuse strategic planners by promising impossibly clean conclusions to armed conflict. Indeed, I would argue that the intrusion of any kind of jargon or acronym into strategic debates, as opposed to in discussions of tactics or techniques, is an indication that somebody is reaching into their bag of pixie dust. Perhaps the most dangerous kind of strategic pixie dust goes by the name of deterrence, which for so long has suggested to us that if we do the right things, we will never have to wage war, or at least serious war, again. And I think that's a particularly dangerous kind of powder to spread, spread around, because it stultifies one's own strategic judgments when the time actually does come to use force to serve the ends of politics. Now, it would be uh, impudent to suggest I have solutions for these obstacles to adaptation, but let me suggest at least two kinds of thoughts for those who have to wrestle with them. And some of the things uh, I'll say, I'm very much following the lead of uh, the people who went before me in the previous panel. The first is simply the need <coughs> for military professionals to, con to commit themselves to think about the nature of modern war and to write about it. The militaries of the West are, I hope, very serious about their own tactical thinking. But much of the thinking about the nature of war, as Clausewitz would put it, and about strategy in general, has been outsourced to the civilian world. To some extent, I'm a beneficiary of that, so I have to limit my complaints. Um, but with all of its many troubles and weaknesses, I don't think that's nearly as true of the Russian general staff. And I think they benefit actually, from having serious military thinkers in uniform writing and thinking about the nature of modern war in settings where they can do so. A commitment to recovering and incorporating that sort of thing into the military has large implications for the professional military education system, first and foremost, but also for the provision the promotion systems make for military thinkers and for the relationships between institutes like this one or academic institutions and the military. My second observation is that modern militaries, if they are to fend off ghosts, slumber, and pixie dust, should force themselves to contemplate a number of the discontinuities that we can fairly easy, easily imagine. Jim Slatton, I think, very accurately um, and tellingly pointed to the, uh, the way in which the Russians have been able to deny use of the air over Ukraine. I think we can push that further. In the next war, we have to expect that we will no longer have secure rear areas. And I don't just mean brigade or divisional tactical operation centers. And when we actually encounter this, even though we know about it at one level, it will be a shock because we know it in our heads. Uh, and even experts and practitioners, and most certainly not politicians and publics, don't yet know that in their viscera, which is something very different. I think we have to learn and accustom ourselves to think strategically about protracted war. The bias in the West, for understandable reasons, has been to think in terms of short conflicts. Of course, as you all know, the Taliban like to say, you may have the watches, but we have the time. Protracted war, I think, is increasingly in our future. And even, I believe, in the case of state-on-state -state conflict. Let us remind ourselves that the era of Blitzkrieg was followed by a war that lasted for years. We have to think as well, and this is, of course, where uh, one, one heard in um, the CGS's remarks and some of the remarks in the previous panel, but the ways in which the relationship between quality and quantity is changing. The armies of the West have evolved in the direction of small and extremely expensive and high-end forces. I have to wonder if that may change, driven in part by technologies such as cheap UAVs and standoff weapons of various kinds. This also implies that our thinking go beyond the issues of regeneration and reconstitution, which the CGS pointed out, but to the old problem of mobilization, to which he alluded, but which may be much more in our future than we would like to think. Finally, and again, following on the discussion of the previous um, panel, I actually think the, use, the, the phrase political warfare, which really goes back to the Second World War, is useful. 
it, it, as a dimension of real war. Um, and I very much take um, Hugh Strand's point about, you know, it's important to distinguish between war and things that are not war. But I think we have also been fortunate in a, in a certain way in fighting people who flay and burn prisoners alive. I think our next conflict we may be up against people who are much better at undermining popular will um, and the will of politicians. And what's important there is not so much our ability to get on Twitter, but it, it's really thinking about the nature of the, the effects uh, that a prolonged campaign of propaganda and subversion can actually accomplish. Now again, none of the issues I've raised is entirely new. Um, for most of the features of contemporary war and likely future war, there are parallels and analogies in history that are at least suggestive if they're not predictive. And that's why military history remains the bedrock of higher level military education. If only because it reveals the myriad ways in which sophisticated militaries and their leaders can be and are surprised by the nature of the war upon which they are embarked. So uh, despite my opening crack, I want to conclude with one word about Brexit from an American point of view. Of the many silly things that I've read or heard people say in the last couple of days, I think one of the silliest is the suggestion that Britain and Britain's military will be devalued as a partner of the United States. The contrary is the case. British soldiers, British generals, British experts carry a great deal of weight in the American national security community. And unless you lose your nerve, and I don't think you will, you defeated the Armada and Napoleon and Adolf Hitler, so I don't think you're gonna be overwhelmed by Mr. Juncker. <laughs> you will continue to do so. We're in an, ex I believe, in an extremely dangerous and getting increasingly dangerous period of international history. And the role you and your army have to play is of great consequence. All the more important then that together we understand the nature of the wars upon which, unfortunately, we will be embarked, neither mistaking them for nor trying to turn them into something alien to their natures. Thank you. <laughs>